Welcome back to Ecological Niches. Today we're going to take a deep dive at one particular organism in the sagebrush community, the wild or feral horse. The sagebrush ecosystem is the most impacted ecosystem in the United States. It is impacted by agriculture, invasive species, recreation, development, and more. One of the hot topics involving the sagebrush ecosystem is that of wild horses, or some refer to them as feral horses. Horse populations, contrary to what many think, are not truly free-range populations, having fences that regulate where they can roam, the range in which they have year-round. Some populations, like the one videoed here from Utah, are even provided with a watering trough that is for all wildlife use, and the horses are easy to find by how they travel to the trough in the evening. This wild horse population increases from 9 to 20 percent on any given year. Wild horses feed primarily on the wild grasses they find in the sagebrush ecosystem, which is also food in one form or another for antelope, rabbits, ants, mule deer, birds, and many, many more is one of the basic food sources for all living things in the sagebrush community. The only other major food source being the sagebrush itself. Wild horses are most similar to the other hoofed animals of the sagebrush ecosystem, including deer and antelope. The differences between the wild horse and these other animals brings us to the controversial topic of today. Before we get to that controversy, a little background information. The wild horse did exist about 10,000 years or so ago in North America when they went extinct from what we killed was the Ice Age. The current population of wild horses, as we have them now, are those who either escaped captivity or were deliberately released as far back as the Spanish conquistadors' arrival on the mainland in 1519. These modern horses do not have the predators that ancient native horses had, including the prehistoric wolves and saber-toothed cats that were common in their day. There is no predator alive today that can truly take down a healthy adult horse. By not having predators to keep the population in check over the last few hundred years, the numbers of wild horses have seemed to either rise and fall with either food and water, or rise and fall with human management and intervention. The reason the wild horse's population is not controlled is that it is able to outcompete the other organisms who do have predators that rely on the same grass and water sources. This competition between species doesn't just affect the two or more species directly involved, but affects the whole ecosystem. Let's take the wild horse and antelope or pronghorn species as an example. Both the wild horse and antelope eat grass, both often appeared in herds containing multiple members, and with an increase in competition over the grass, this means that the antelope population must be affected. There may seem that we look at an area that there is an infinite amount of grass and therefore no concern over animals competing over it. This is not the case. Grass grows mainly in the spring and early summer, and then because of the heat either slows its growth immensely or stops growing entirely. This grass is then eaten for the rest of the year. There is a finite amount of food or energy contained in that grass. When horses or any other animal take some of that energy, then it isn't there for the others, including the cattle or sheep that are yearly users of the sagebrush rangeland, with 60% of the BLM land leased for this use that represents 35% of our national beef supply. Horses taking what historically was something else's energy affects the total amount other organisms can live there. If left unchecked, any organism without predators, such as the wild horse, is only controlled by their population growing to numbers that the food supply cannot support them, and that there then are massive die-offs of individuals in years of drought or disease, and then the cycle starts over. Predators, keeping populations in check naturally by removing some of the population, are integral parts of their ecosystem that we will get to in a later video in more depth. Humans, at different points in time, have done different things with wild horse populations to keep them in check and maintain the ability to place our beef supplying cattle on this land. It used to be that as populations arose as part of their herd would be rounded up and the young taken by horse trainers and those past their prime training age would be taken and turned into various products like dog food, glue, gelatin, and more. In 1971, the Wild Free Roaming Horses and Burrows Act, Public Law 92-195, was signed into law by Richard Nixon and has been amended a few times since and makes it illegal to kill wild horses for population control or to make products. Since that time, management has shifted. Horse populations have been assigned limits for specific ranges, and when those limits are overcome, some of the wild horses are removed from the range and placed into holding cells. 
As you can see from this data, there are way more wild horses on the range now than what the numbers were told were allowed to be there. This is the controversy at heart. When we put horses into pens, less than 15% are adopted out. So do we keep placing more in pens, even though the population in captivity has continued to climb and is currently, according to the BLM, above 63,000 individuals in captivity? How can we control the population of wild horses, or should we control the population of wild horses in the wild? Currently, this population in Utah is partially controlled by rounding up and putting in pens, and also partially controlled by giving them injections via darts that are birth control to all the female horses or mares in the population every two years. The ethical boundaries surrounding wild horses are harder to navigate than ever because of people's attachments to wild horses or mustangs, as they are often referred to. The emotional bond is closer because for over a thousand years or more, humans have had horses in many communities to work and make civilization function. Not to mention all the movies in modern cinema, such as, as you can see, Hildago, Spirit, Black Beauty, Man from Snowy River, Flicka, and many, many more. This is a complex issue with no one correct answer, but will be decided and solutions implemented in the coming decade or less. By knowing the whole picture, we hope that the consequences of our solutions, good or bad, can be more easily understood and that better solutions that balance ecosystem needs and human desires can be brought to the front of these decisions. There are many different views on what should be done with wild horses. Some groups think that wild horses deserve to be there, that they've been there longer than our ancestors have been in the United States. Therefore, they should be free on the range, given all the land they need. Other groups, those with cattle particularly on the range, need that land to make a living and to produce the beef that contains about 35% of our total beef consumption in the United States. Those concerned about the ecology and wildlife of the area want horses to be maintained at certain levels so that wildlife and other organisms can have the adequate energy levels from food in their systems to maintain levels that they've had. There are many needs and wants to be weighed just in humanity, let alone the ecosystems present in the area. Our hope is that you can see different perspectives and the reasons why people think and want what they do, and that one no solution can fix this controversial and difficult problem. Like with any problem, the hope comes in that humanity has and will continue to find ways to work together to better each other, to take care of things around us, and to understand and implement decisions that can improve life and improve the ecosystems and ecology around themselves in a balanced way. Thanks for watching another Ecological Niches video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to get future videos. If you have any ideas, suggestions, or questions, then leave a comment down below. Once again, thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.